name's Zach, and I'm the outreach coordinator here at the CORE. I'll be giving our message for today. So the title is Understanding God's Love. And this one is near and dear to my heart because we talk about God's love and it being unconditional, but a lot of times I don't know if we all understand what that means, and different people have different understandings. So this message is really about understanding God's love according to what the Bible says and knowing how we receive God's love and also give it. So to be holy is to have a personal relationship with Christ through trusting in his sacrificial death as payment for our sins. As Hebrews 10.10 says from a Christian's view, we have been made holy by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So through trusting in the sacrifice of Christ for holiness, we receive the unconditional compassion of God. But is God's love just compassion? And how do we become aware of what God's love is really like? Well, what do you guys think? Anyone have an idea? Where do we find out what God's love is like? What is, what is the standard by which we judge truth by in the Christian faith? The Bible. The Bible, right. So we go to the Bible, and what we find in 1 John 4.16... It says that God is love. Think about that statement. God is love. 1 John 4, 16. So we find a description of God being love. And, and true love coming from Him. But what is that true love? When we go to 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6, we're given the true definition of love. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked or easily angered. And it does not keep an account of wrongs suffered. So if God is love, then he is patient. He is kind. He's selfless, humble. He is not easily angered. And he keeps no record of wrongs. So not only is this a description of God's love, but also a description of Him. It describes His basic character. So because God is true love, as 1 John 4.16 says, true love is what God always does. So because God is love, true love is what He always does. So what's interesting, when we look at 1 Corinthians 13.4-6, we see that not only is God's compassion shown, saying that he's patient, kind, uh, selfless, he keeps no record of wrongs, but we also see that his correction is highlighted. When it says that he is not easily angered, notice it doesn't say that love is not angered, but that it's not easily angered. So God is not easily angered, but that doesn't mean he doesn't get angry. That doesn't mean he doesn't have a just anger. And so we see in this definition both God's compassion and correction. In the Old Testament, we see a near identical and very similar definition. Exodus 34, 6 through 7 says that the Lord passed in front of Moses, and when he did, he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and truth who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing, violation of his law, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So we see how similar this one is to the other definition, and that both show God's compassion and his correction. We also notice that the same God is, or that God is conveyed in the same way, both in the Old Testament and the New, showing that He does not change. Across time, God stays the same. So when we consider God's forgiveness, if He keeps no record of wrongs, but yet He punishes in a disciplinary way, how do we reconcile the two? We can by, by realizing that although God forgives us when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, He forgives us of, their, of our sins, He doesn't take away the consequences. Those negative consequences are still there. 
so that we can learn from them. And so when we do wrong things and when we suffer from them or we hurt others, the negative consequences from those things are there to teach us why that sin was wrong so that we really see that it is sin. Otherwise, we wouldn't realize it. We wouldn't learn. And so that is God's discipline. It's the way that He corrects us and prompts us into His compassion. So to understand this more, I'm going to give you guys some examples of God's unconditional compassion. So here are some concrete examples. Support and kindness of parents, other family members, friends, uh, neighbors, co-workers, our physical needs. He gives us oxygen, fresh water, sunlight, food, and shelter. Providing us with a free education in public school. Giving us employment opportunities so that we can be productive in society. Giving us a body with all of its capabilities and our giftings that make us unique and, and better at some things than others. And then most importantly, having Jesus die on the cross for our sins. So here are some examples of God's unconditional correction. Discipline from our parents, family members, friends, neighbors, teachers, and bosses. Law enforcement and court system. The negative consequences from poor decisions, such as pain, suffering, loss of friends, side effects, withdrawals of drug use, harm done to relationships, STDs, permanent damage to our bodies and others, job loss, home homelessness, and fear, etc. Generally, discipline is meant to steer us into and keeping us in a saving relationship with the Father. As it says in Hebrews 12, 6, God disciplines those he loves. In other words, it is meant to lead us to and keep us in the saving grace or unconditional love of God. Therefore, although God's compassion is unconditional, humanity receives it conditionally through accepting God's grace through Jesus' sacrificial death, trusting in it, repenting of sin, and living obediently. So before someone accepts Jesus as their Savior, God reaches out to the person in grace through forms of unconditional compassion just mentioned and tries prompting he or she into a saving relationship with him through a grace called prevenient grace. It is the grace that comes before the person's response to accepting Jesus as their Savior. So for an example, um, someone accepts an invitation from a friend to attend church. So that, that friend will invite the person to come to church to me. So that, that friend may not share the gospel with that person, but he's inviting he or she to go to church where the pastor will give them the gospel. But the person has to make that choice in order whether or not they're going to go and hear it. So the person has to choose to go. Once they do, they have to choose, they have to, choose to listen, to respect what the pastor is saying, and then they have the choice of either accepting Christ through accepting the, the gospel or rejecting it. So an example from my own life is that before I was a believer, I remember playing video games at my parents' house. I was still living there. And all of a sudden I had this prompting by God to read my Bible. It just came out of the blue. And I know it was the Holy Spirit. And so it was prompting me, you need to read your Bible. You should read your Bible. And for a while, I think I rejected it. But eventually I said, you know what, I should. It's right. I just have this feeling that it's right. And that's what I should do. So I started reading the New Testament. And eventually, the gospel was presented to me with all the various parts so that I could understand it. And then I, after I understood it through reading the Bible, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. So God gave me the grace, but I had to make the choice to obey, to read the Bible and then to accept Jesus as my Savior. So, here are some other conditions through which we receive God's unconditional love. So these are the basic ways that, that people typically receive God's unconditional love. First and foremost is trusting in Jesus as our Savior. Secondarily, receiving revelation and affirmation of this truth through Bible reading, prayer, attending church, the sacraments, like communion and baptism, and remaining obedient through good works and deeds for others.
So these are all ways that we come to know God and remain in relationship with Him. John 15 highlights this, and it's a, it's a good example to, uh, to gain another insight about this principle. John 15 says, this is the chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither you can unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. 